All right, I'm live in Memorex. All right, okay, just no, not the, not the, sorry, it's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, just I don't want to. Okay, then. <clears throat> okay, everybody, you guys can see me, right? Okay, I just started. Okay, I can see it, it's live. Merian Gran Bruheim. It's a nice name. Merian Gran Bruheim. Okay. I like that name. But is that really your name? All righty. We're just waiting a few more minutes until enough of the regulars show up. Just pray for me. I'm actually at a precious brother's house. Him and his wife have been gracious enough to allow me to stay here while I'm in L.A. Because I can't afford to be in a hotel room for two weeks, right? But, you know, God bless them. The Lord Jesus preserved them, washed them in his blood, and Holy Spirit filled them and the family for the glory of Jesus Christ. So he's allowed me also to live, live stream here in the comfort of his home. I'm in his living room. So the Lord Jesus richly blessed them for their hospitality, graciousness towards the servant of Jesus Christ. And the brother himself is an apologist. So pray God will use him mightily and fill him with the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ, right? Because we love the Father. We love the Son. We love the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Okay, you guys miss me? Okay. Oh, yes. You guys miss me? Yeah, you, you, if, you're not, if you're not camera shy, you can show yourself, bro. You want to show yourself? Say hi. I don't have a headache. I don't have a haircut. Oh, who cares, man? What is wrong with you, dude? Come here. Right here, this guy here. Can you see? Come here. Uh, well, okay, yeah. so sure, yeah. Don't, don't, don't break the chair. There you go. Hey, that's the guy right there. On, that's everybody. his YouTube page is called Idiotai Apologetics. Smash the like button on his videos. Subscribe to his channel, Idiotai. Because of his graciousness, I'm able to come here and live stream and be used of the Lord Jesus Christ to bless you. So again, say, look, say hi. One more time. Say. Hey, what's going it on? It takes a couple second delay, right? Right there. He's he's worried because he hasn't ha got a haircut. <laughs> he's fighting a losing battle. He's going bald, but he just doesn't know it. Okay. Living in the denial. All right. All right, folks. Hopefully today I will start a new series on proving, demonstrating beyond any reasonable doubt, <clears throat> providing the irrefutable proof from Scripture. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is not the Archangel Michael. If by the Archangel Michael you mean a created angelic being, <clears throat> an angelic spirit creature, right? And I'll explain what I mean when we get into that. But even before I discuss that, I want to answer a question that was asked of me by Choose Jesus several days ago. He's here. He asked me a question because he had mentioned that Satan in his fall took a third of the angels with him. And I corrected that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I saw in the comment sections that Andrew Martin was interested in hearing the answer to that. Right. So we'll begin. Hopefully, we'll get all the regular folks here. Last night, we had 144. For me, that's a lot. For David Wood, that's like a joke. <laughs> but in time, in due course, by the grace of God's Spirit, we'll build up the channel so that we can get about 1,000 people watching. Hit the like button. Pass on these videos. Try to get people to subscribe and to pray for this ministry, to pray for me and my family. Pray for the powerful anointing for the glory of Jesus Christ. To be spirit-filled, to obey Jesus, to love Jesus, to, to walk worthy of Jesus Christ, and not be ashamed of the beauty of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. In time, Revelation. And again, let me explain why I'm saying hopefully we'll get a lot of people. It's not. I pray it's not. I ask the Holy Spirit to wash my heart, wash my motives, transform me. To have the mind of Jesus Christ, the heart of Jesus Christ, and do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. The reason why I want more people is so that more people can benefit from the knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit. If I speak truth, it's because the Holy Spirit is enabling me to speak truth. And that's the truth the Holy Spirit <clears throat> reveals to all the members of the body of Christ. If I speak error, may the Holy Spirit correct that in me, not to repeat it, and save you from that, right? That's why. I want more people to be educated, to know the scriptures. And not only know the scriptures, but by the power of the Holy Spirit to live out the scriptures for the glory of Jesus so that we can show Jesus we love him, right? And not just pay lip service. All right? So anyway. All right. God bless you guys. 
Amen. Please, Lord, guide us. Amen, amen, amen. So <clears throat> let me begin. Let me begin by asking the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to fill us. Father, we love you. <clears throat> we love the Lord Jesus, your Son. We love your Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy upon us. Sanctify us by your Spirit. Sanctify me. Father, I ask for a powerful anointing from your Spirit to recall the Scriptures correctly and interpret them perfectly and sanctify my motives. Wash my heart in the blood of Jesus to do it to bring glory to Jesus Christ so that your Spirit will use me to cause every one of us to fall more passionately in love with Jesus, to love Jesus, to live for Jesus, to obey Jesus, and die for Jesus if necessary, Father. May the Lord Jesus Christ increase in us. May we decrease. And Father, loosen my tongue to speak clearly. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life, with health, to do this. You don't need me, Father. I know this. We need you. We need your Son, the Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. And bless your people. Save us from attacks of the enemy and distractions. Please, my God. Father, have your way and constrain the evil one so that he will not distract us as we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And bless our loved ones. In my case, my two angels, those two girls you gave me, they are yours, your gift to me. Bless them and preserve them and love them and provide for them, nourish them, and save them from all reparable da damage, Lord. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. And Holy Spirit, please, I belong to you. We belong to you. Use me in your might, your strength to glorify Christ, and we love you. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> okay. Everyone in the saddle? Again, I want to thank my brother. His YouTube page is Idiota Apologetics. Pray for him, his lovely wife, their children. I'm here in the comfort of his home. He allowed, allowed me to come here for two weeks. I'm going to be a burden on him. So pray God will bless him for the kindness of his heart to allow me to stay here for free. Because remember, we're in full-time ministry, right? The Lord provides our daily bread. But if you're looking to get rich, don't do ministry. If you're looking to get spiritually rich, to glorify Jesus Christ, then by all means, get into ministry. If that's your calling by the power of the Holy Spirit. So bless his brother by praying for him and his family. Yep, hit the like team, right? The like button. Someone said like team. Hit the like team. Okay. Oh, you're saying to the team, you animal. Arr, and your name is animal. Before I get into the series, because I want to start a series on proving that Jesus Christ is not the Archangel Michael. And I'm going to finish my series on Jesus in Psalm 110, if the Lord permits. And I'm going to start other series, other sessions on other core doctrines of the Christian faith, like the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, the canon of Scripture, the message of salvation. I have a lot that I want to discuss if the Holy Spirit gives me the health and the holiness to do it for the glory of Christ. And as long as you're interested, right, in hearing me, Teach the word. So tonight I'm going to start a series demonstrating from scripture Jesus is not the Archangel Michael, particularly in response to whom I consider to be a cult leader who started his own cult movement, Gregory Stafford. At one time I used to respect this man, but right now, after watching his current videos, you can see, if you're born of the Spirit, truly you can see how demonized and just evil this person has become and, and how just wickedly deceptive he is and how shamelessly he butchers the scripture but by the power of the holy spirit i want to expose him silence him and i'm calling him to a public debate is jesus the archangel michael hopefully he won't be a coward and run from me but face me and i promise you by the power of the triune god i will decimate his arguments and expose him for the glory of jesus right so i'm going to deal with his objections in particular but before i begin that i'm going to answer a question is it true that Satan took a third of the angels with him. Someone had asked me this question, and even our friend Andrew Martin, whom I know the Lord Jesus will bring him back to saving faith, wanted to know the answer to the question because people have been taught that Satan, when he fell, took a third of the angelic host with him. How many of you have heard that? Now, one thing I aim in, in my sessions, and I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm quite successful. I want to be as biblical as possible. Anything I believe, anything I affirm, I want to be able to demonstrate it from the sound interpretation of the scriptures, right? So there have been things I've been taught as a Protestant by Protestants that turned out to be less than accurate or completely wrong, deriving doctrines from wrong passages, meaning passages that don't teach those particular doctrines. For example, the doctrine that says that Satan 
was an anointed cherub that fell. That is based on a passage of scripture, Ezekiel 28, 11, 19, that really, if you read it carefully, contextually, has nothing to do with Satan. Or that Satan, is his name is Lucifer, who wanted to be like the Most High and ascend above the stars of God, but then was hurled to the earth as part of his punishment. That too is based on Isaiah 14, a passage that if you actually read carefully, contextually, has nothing to do with Satan. In time, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I'll demonstrate that. But today I want to address the claim that Satan took a third of the angels with him when he fell, caused a third of the angels to rebel against God, thereby becoming evil spirits, <clears throat> typically called demons, right? Are you guys ready for that? Uh, I don't know what you mean. Did I exegete the entire Bible, Edmund Dantes? Are you asking sincerely? Or are you asking to mock me and attack me? I don't know. Listen, guys, this is not the channel to attack, to mock, to debate. If you want to debate me, set up a debate, we'll debate. If you're asking sincere questions, I'll answer. But if you're asking to try to cause trouble, don't waste your time because you know you're not going to last. Okay? Don't do that. This is a teaching session, meaning I hope to be used by God to teach you the word and entertain serious questions and answer them to the best of my ability. If you're not one of those, leave. Do yourself a favor, leave. This is not a channel for you, honestly. It's not a channel for you. How do you answer someone who asks me the question, did I spend my time exegeting every single verse throughout your years, if not as someone trying to mock me? Do you know of any person on this side of, uh, of eternity that can say that they've exegeted every single passage of Scripture? Really? Even if I if I had done that, does that mean I've exegeted correctly? The only one who has perfect knowledge of the entire Bible and knows its meaning perfectly is the author of the Bible, the triune God, especially the Holy Spirit, who appointed the men to produce the scriptures that he inspired them to produce. So how do I take this statement, guys? Do you think it's mockery? Anyway. Well, that said... Let's go to the passage. Let's go to the passage that is commonly used to prove <clears throat> that Satan caused a third of the angels to rebel against God. No, you just we just started, Medic. I was just introducing the topic, so you didn't miss much. Anyway, let's go to the passage. Anyway, I have some admins, moderators, that will take care of the nuisances, right? Let's go to the passage that's often used to try to demonstrate that Satan took a third of the angels with him when he rebelled against God. The passage is Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 9. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 9. Okay, Edmund. I, I, I've seen you before, and I do believe you're a sincere brother because you've been here quite often, and you haven't given me a hard time. <sighs> You know, uh, just let me again repeat, Edmund Dantes, there's no one on this side of etern eternity who has been able to perfectly exegete every passage of Scripture. That's not going to happen on this side of eternity. But now let's focus, Edmund, focus on the Word of God, focus on the Holy Spirit using me and not me. May I disappear and Jesus Christ be glorified. Let's read the passages. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 9. We'll first read it and we'll go back step by step. <clears throat> and I pray the Holy Spirit will use this to bless you, right? And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, <clears throat> travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now notice three. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now the beautiful thing about Revelation, Revelation goes on to explain who the dragon is, what the seven heads are, right? The ten horns are and the seven crowns. You just got to read the book of Revelation. I may unpack it. I may not have time to unpack it because I want to stick to the salient relevant part. Read verse 4. This is the passage that is used to show that Satan took a third of the angels with him in his downfall. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. For to devour her child as soon as was born. So verse 4 is the key. Now let's read 5. Okay. Let's read 5. 
And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And that's Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord. And this is an allusion to Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 to 9. Here, John is saying that the child born, who is Jesus, the Messiah, fulfills the promise of Psalm 2, specifically Psalm 2, 8 to 9. But follow with me. A man child, a male child, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days. Now notice seven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought against his angels. Right? And the dragon fought. <clears throat> Sorry, I misread that. I apologize. I'm, I'm learning to read the King James again. And the dragon fought and his angels. So dragon and his angels fought Michael and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was there pl place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, are we ready to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we ready to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit? No, it's not referring to Mary. It's referring to the nation of Israel. In previous sessions, I unpacked the meaning of Revelation 12. The imagery is taken from the Old Testament, imagery that describes the nation of Israel. But I'll get to that. Okay. Now, we know who the dragon is, right? Verse 9. We're told who the dragon is, correct? That ancient serpent, the serpent of old. This, again, John is telling you where he's getting this from as the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to look back to the Old Testament and then unpack the meaning of this Old Testament language symbolism. He's now looking back to Genesis 3, where the serpent tempted the woman, right? Now, if you read Genesis 3 in its context, the impression you would get if you just had Genesis 3, guys, I need you to listen because I want you to learn because I trust the Holy Spirit. Enable me to interpret these passages correctly for the glory of Christ. My trust is in the Holy Spirit. Your trust is in the Holy Spirit, not me. Okay. If you just read Genesis 3 in its context and you didn't have the rest of the Bible, the impression that you would be given, the impression you'd be given is that that serpent is an animal, right? If I didn't have the rest of the Bible and I didn't have Revelation, if I just read Genesis 3, the impression would be that that serpent is an actual animal, a talking serpent, an animal speaking to Eve, right? However, when John comes to explain the passage, when the Holy Spirit opens John's mind to understand Genesis 3 and interprets the, the language of Genesis 3, it turns out, here's the shocker, it turns out, for some of you should be a shocker, it wasn't an animal. That serpent wasn't an animal. That serpent was a spirit being, a spirit creature whom we call the devil. Notice what John did not say. John did not say it's the devil who possessed the serpent. It's the devil who entered the serpent's body and spoke through him as his instrument. The devil is the serpent. The serpent is the devil. You get it? The serpent is the devil. The devil is the serpent. Satan is the, the serpent. The serpent is Satan. Because oftentimes people think that was an actual animal that Satan spoke through or possessed. Not according to John. That serpent wasn't an actual animal, meaning a creature created from the earth. He's a spirit creature, namely Satan, the devil. Medic, if you understand the language of scripture, being brought to your belly is a sign of being conquered, subjugated, bringing someone under your feet and humiliating him and making him eat the dust of the ground. Let me prove that to you. Micah 7, 17. Micah 7, 17. Micah chapter 7, verse 17. He's asked me the question, why was it made to move on its belly? That is simply metaphorical language, language used to show that this serpent will be humiliated and brought to the ground under the feet of the seed. Here, Micah 7, 17. Read with me, medic. Are you ready? Micah 7, 17. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of Yehovah, our God, and shall fear because of thee. Did you catch it? 
They shall lick the dust like a serpent. Now here it's referring to an actual serpent that crawls on the ground. But if you let the New Testament explain Genesis 3, that is not an actual serpent, but a spirit being that serpentine, right? And that spirit being is the devil himself. The serpent is not an animal that the devil possessed. Look, I didn't make it up. Revelation 12, 9. Let's read it again. King of Kings, I don't know if you're following me. The reason why it says like a serpent, Micah 7, 17, because there it's talking about human beings being humiliated, subjected, brought beneath the feet of God's people as a sign of their humiliation, forced to crawl on their belly to eat dust like a serpent. So there it's likening humans to actual serpents. The question is, again, King of Kings, I know you are, so I'm just trying to explain it a little further. The question is, in Genesis 3, is that an actual serpent or is that a spirit creature that's called a serpent? Well, let me repeat again so you don't get confused. Let me repeat again so you don't get confused. If all I had was Genesis 3, that's it, then the impression is it's an animal, right? I believe so, could be, but I'll try to unpack that in a future session. Yes, could be. The iconography depicts that the ancients were aware of spirit creatures that were serpentine. In fact, could be the seraphim of Isaiah 6, the word seraph is also used of serpents. So that means that the seraphim could appear as serpents, had a serpentine shape. But Lord willing, I'm going to have to defer that for a future session, right? Are you with me there? Okay, let me help you understand how to interpret Scripture in its context. Okay, now, if all I had, if all I had was Genesis 3, then I'd walk away with the impression it's an actual animal, right? Ooh. Actual animal, right? If that's all I had, Genesis 3. But since we're Christians and we now have the fullness of God's revelation, understand what I'm saying? We have the fullness of God's revelation, and we believe John is part of that revelation. So John is not speaking on his own desire, but he's speaking as the Holy Spirit is teaching him and helping him to understand the Old Testament imagery. Then John shows us, John shows us that that serpent is not an animal. That serpent is the devil himself. Let's look at Revelation 12, 9 and Revelation 20, verse 2. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out. Notice he doesn't possess a dragon. He's called a dragon. That old serpent, notice he is a serpent. He's not simply possessing a serpent. Called the devil and Satan. So the devil is the serpent. He is the dragon. He doesn't simply possess a dragon or a serpent. Revelation 20, verse 2, and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Not tonight, Mikey. We're not going to change the subject. Focus. Do not change the subject. Is everyone with me there? So according to John's explanation of Genesis 3, an explanation he received by the Holy Spirit, because he's in the Spirit, and the Spirit is illuminating him to understand the imagery. Is the serpent of Genesis 3 an animal or is the serpent a spirit creature whom we now know as the devil and Satan? Who is he? <clears throat> Mikey, I'm going to ask you again. Stop bringing in points that you're going to force me to correct you. You assume that Satan's name is Lucifer because of your misreading of Isaiah 14. Stop by your head, brother, because I don't have time to unpack Isaiah 14 to show you that Lucifer in its context is actually the king of Babylon and that Lucifer comes from the Latin. So unless you believe that Satan was named Lucifer in Latin, so God spoke to him in Latin, let's just be patient and learn. It's Revelation 12, verse 9 and 20, verse 2, Medic for Christ. Revelation 20, 12, verse 9, and Revelation 20, verse 2. You want me there? Is that clear? Okay. Say, Christian, I think you want me to block you, Lena. 
Okay. I think that's what you want to make my day. Okay, now let's get back, go back to the issue. I just want to you to see how Revelation interprets the serpent imagery of Genesis chapter 3. Zina, that's okay. Many people think it's about Satan. That's fine. I'm not here to attack them and saying they're heretics, but a careful reading of Isaiah 14, Zina, it's not about Satan. Now you can say that behind every human ruler, there's an evil spirit that controls that ruler so that in Isaiah 14, those speaking of the king of Babylon, folks, just read Isaiah 14 from 3 to 23. It's about the king of Babylon. But you can say, well, those speaking about the king, it's also addressing the spirit that possesses the king. And in the context of the king of Babylon, that would be the devil. You can say that, but I'm saying if you just read the chapter, Zena, just read it. Don't take Mike Winger's or my opinion at face value. Read Isaiah 14 from 3 to 23. It's about the king of Babylon, a human ruler who thinks he's a god, who can rival God. And God says, I'm going to cut you down to size and that your grave is going to be a bed of maggots. And I'm going to show that you're nothing. You with me there? Is that clear? God willing, I will do a session on Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Not tonight. What I'm doing is challenging one of the passages often used to show that Satan caused a third of the angelic host to become demons, evil spirits, when he initially rebelled against God. So now everyone with me on Revelation 12, 9 and 20, verse 2, that John, filled with the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, tells us the serpent in Genesis 3 is not an animal, but a spirit creature called the devil. Right? Did you guys get it? <clears throat> okay. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Let's reread that. Let's reread that. Let's reread it to see in Revelation 12, verse 4. This is the passage. No, they're not. Holy Trinity, Trinity they're not. They're not the same. They're not the same. Lucifer and Satan are not the same. Revelation 12, 4. Let's read it again. Okay, focus on this topic now, on this topic. Here's the passage used to show that Satan took a third of the angels with him. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. See, that's it. Satan's rebellion caused a third of the stars of heaven to rebel. And stars means angels here and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Okay, focus with me. Everyone want me there? Holy Tornado, whoever's arguing with you that they're two different entities is right. That person is right. Okay. Now, number one, when you want to know what a term means, you have to see its meaning in the immediate context, right? It is true that angels are called stars, but it's also true human beings are called stars. Right? Let me repeat again. It is true that angels are called stars, stars. But it's also true that human beings are called stars and are even likened to stars. Human beings are likened to stars and are called stars in the Bible. Let me show you several places. Are you ready? Are you ready for the evidence? Because you asked me to unpack this. Choose Jesus. Are you here? Because you asked me the question. Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Philippians 2, 14 to 16. There's a lot of meat in Scripture. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to understand the scriptures and save us from error. Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Watch here. A star can refer to a human being or an angelic creature. Let's read. Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Yep, hit that like button. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now, here the word lights means the stars in the sky, right? That's the implication of the language here, that you shine as lights in the world, the stars that shine forth in the world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, 
that I have not run in vain, near, neither labored in vain. So you're going to be like the stars, lights that shine in this dark world, giving light and illumination to this world. Do you see it? Okay, if you catch that, I'm going to give you another example. Humans are likened to stars and even called stars. Okay. Daniel 12, 2 to 3. Daniel 12, 2 to 3. It's going to get better, Sam Price. Daniel 12, 2 to 3. Specifically, verse 3. It's in verse 3, but we're going to look at the context. Daniel 12, 2 to 3. You got it, Fadi. But Jesus is not a star. He's the sun. Right? Well, this, well, scientists would call the sun a star. Remember, in, in, in ancient times, the sun was distinguished from the stars. But today, in modern scientific jargon, the sun is a star. But he's more specifically the sun, S-U-N, right? But Daniel 12, 2 to 3. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. The brightness of the firmament. Well, what's in the firmament? Do you remember Genesis chapter 1? Right? And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So believers who are righteous and convert sinners to the path will be like the stars in the firmament, shining with the glory of God. You with me there? Let's see what the Lord says about us shining if we are true believers who endure to the end by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 13, verse 43. Thank you, Glenn. God bless you. Matthew 13, verse 43. And I want to give you what I consider to be the best one last because it directly ties in with Revelation. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the king their father, who hath ears to hear, let him fear. So you're going to shine like the sun. Why? Because the light of Christ, who is the sun, shines in and through you. So you are like the stars in the firmament, the lights in the firmament. You will shine like the sun because Jesus Christ, it's his light that shines through you for the glory of God. Is that clear? I, mean, I saved the best for last, but I want to make sure you're getting it. The best for last because this directly ties in with Revelation 12. Now let's go to Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Now before you post it, Protestant, before you post it, don't post it yet. Joseph sees two dreams, two dreams in which he sees his parents and his brothers subjugated to him. We're going to look at the second dream, not the first. Genesis 37, 9 to 11. Genesis 37, 9 to 11. And this directly ties in with Revelation. And he dreamed, Joseph dreamed, yet another dream, and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream, pay attention, and behold the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. Sun and moon and 11 stars. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, Now notice how Jacob understood the dream. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down, come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now, did you see what Joseph saw? He saw 11 stars, sun and moon, bowing to him. And do you see how Jacob understood it? What do you mean? I, your mother, and your brothers will bow to you? So how did Jacob interpret the dream? The son was Jacob. The mother was his wife, and the 11 stars were his 11 brothers. So did you see the 11 stars here refer to the 11 brothers of Joseph, the 11 sons of Jacob? You see it or no? Okay, if you're confused, put a two because I want to clarify. Any twos? Okay. Now, here is my question. Why did Joseph see 11 stars, not 12, when Jacob has 12 sons? 
Why did Joseph see 11 stars, not 12? I don't know if you guys are being serious, Watchman Shallow, or you're just playing. Because Joseph is the 12th star. Joseph is the 12th star. You got it. So now if we add them all together, how many stars? 12. Jacob has 12 sons. They are 12 stars. Jacob is the sun and his wife is the moon. So remember, sun and moon, Jacob, his wife, 12 stars, the 12 sons of Jacob, which collectively make up the nation of Israel, right? Now let's go back to Revelation 12.1. Revelation 12.1. Sun and moon, Jacob and his wife, 12 stars, the 12 sons of Jacob that make up the, the nation of Israel. Who cares, love life? Who cares? Why are you bothering me, bro? You know, Padre Pio is going to be upset with you, trying to get me angry because people are attacking me. He's not the first guy who's going to attack me. He's not the last. Okay? Revelation 12.1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, notice the imagery, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Sound familiar? Just like John interpreted Genesis 3 for us and told us the serpent is the devil, John now is interpreting the imagery of Genesis 37, where Joseph saw his 11 brothers as 11 stars, and Jacob and his wife as the sun and the moon, and then connecting them with the woman of Genesis 3. Edmund, you know you're going to leave right now, lad. Bye-bye, sir. Don't come back. <coughs> you with me there? So according to John, the woman with the sun and the moon under her feet and the 12 stars... Who is that woman now in light of Joseph's dream? Who is the woman? Mo, I'm going to try it again. The woman with the 12 stars on her head and the sun under her feet in light of Joseph's dream is not Mary. Pathfinder, are you listening? Wow. Man, I'm really not communicating clearly. Can you show me how that can be Mary in Revelation 12 when John is quoting and alluding to Genesis chapter 3, the woman and the serpent, and quoting Genesis 37, Joseph's dream, his 11 brothers are 11 stars, Joseph, his father, is the sun, his wife, his stepmother, is the moon. How can this be Mary when it's about the nation? The church? You're kidding me, Ron Trevoli. So Joseph was seeing the church. Yep. Joseph was seeing the church. Okay. I'm going to try it again. Revelation 12 is referring to Joseph's dream where he saw 11 of his brothers as stars. Jacob, his father, as the sun, his stepmother, as the moon. John now sees the 12 stars and the sun and moon and a woman. When you add it all together, who is he seeing? The nation of Israel. You with me there? Do you want to know? Where the church figures in, in John's interpretation, the woman is not the church. The woman is Israel and her children who believe in Christ are the church. Revelation 12, 13. Revelation 12, 13. I'm sorry. Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. Taking a little longer than I thought. That's fine. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So here's the woman. Here's her seed. Who, who are her seed? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The seed of the woman who believe in Jesus 
That's the church. And I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. I know people think it's Mary. I know Roman Catholics, Orthodox like to use it to prove it's Mary. But contextually, it's not Mary. It's, it's Israel. And I'll prove that in a minute. I'll show you in a minute. Just be patient. But did you see, is the woman the church? Or are the seed of the woman who believe in Christ the church? Revelation 12, 17. Okay, so if the seed of the woman, Revelation 12, 17, who believe in Christ is the church, then who is the woman again? The woman has the sun and the moon under her feet and 12 stars on her head. The woman in light of Genesis 3 and Genesis 37 is Israel. In other words, here's what John is telling you. Although Genesis 3 is about Eve, Eve as the woman becomes a picture of another woman, the nation of Israel, from whom comes Jesus the Messiah, and those who believe in him become her children. They become spiritual Jews. You understand what Revelation 12 just did? Revelation 12 just explained to you Genesis 3, Genesis 37, and other images in the Old Testament explained it to you by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to tell you that woman, which was Eve in Genesis 3, is a picture of Israel from whom comes Jesus. And because of him, we who believe in him now become her children. Not in this context, Nabil. I know you're trying desperately. Don't try too hard, my brother. Okay. Just listen. So you can learn. So you ever want me there? You understand that according to John, the woman of Genesis 3 becomes Israel. How do we know it's Israel? Because that woman has the 12 stars on her head, sun and moon under her feet, which is direct allusion to Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, 9 to 11. And oftentimes Israel is depicted as a woman and also as the bride of God. Here, let me show you. Revelation 12, 2. Let's look at it. Revelation 12, 2. <clears throat> Revelation 12, 2. And she being with child, cry, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Let me show you what John is doing here. This is an allusion to Genesis 3, 16. Reach Revelation 12, 2 with Genesis 3, 16. And then it connects with Israel again. Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. Did you catch Revelation 12.2? That woman was in great pain, sorrow, and anguish as she gave birth to the Messiah. Edmund, is that you again under another alias, Raphael Israel? Edmund, is that you? Tell me, be honest, is that you? Did you see it? Again, do me a favor, Protestant believer. Post Revelation 12, 2 and Genesis 3, 16 back to back. Back to back. It's funny, right? <laughs> I don't know what a Robo Roblox ad is, OD Gaming. I have no control over my advertisements. Okay. Post Genesis 3, 16, Revelation 12, 2 back to back. May God save you from Islam and Muhammad bring you to the feet of Jesus. Now read it back to back. Again, what is John alluding to? And she being, read with me, read with me. She being the with child cry, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now notice, may he do so unless you want to go to hell and burn with Muhammad who's in hell because God has damned Muhammad to hell. May the Lord Jesus save you from that wicked antichrist. Anyway, Revelation 12, 2, Genesis 3, 16. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now notice Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Did you catch the connection? Do you see what John is doing again? He's taking the language of Genesis 3 and applying it to this woman in Revelation 12. That serpent of Genesis 3, he said, is Satan. That woman there? That is a reference to the woman of Genesis 3. But Genesis 3, Eve, then becomes a picture of Israel. 
So what John is telling you, follow me, pay attention. John is telling you the woman of Genesis 3, though Eve initially is a picture of another woman, namely Israel, the woman, the bride of God, from whom comes Jesus the Messiah, and by faith in whom we become her children. Is that everyone with me there? Did you understand what John just did with the imagery of Genesis? Now, let me further prove to you the woman is Israel. Do me a favor. Again, Protestant, thank you for serving us. Post Genesis 3, 16, back to back with Jeremiah 4, 31, back to back with Revelation 12, 2. Guys, we're going to read all three verses back to back. Genesis 3, 16, Jeremiah 4, 31, and Revelation 12, 2. Okay. Read. Okay. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now notice what God says about Israel. Folks, read Jeremiah 4.31. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish of her that bringeth forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of my murderers. Did you catch it? Israel is described as a woman in travail giving birth to her first child. And then I'll tie that in Revelation 12 too. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Did you guys catch it? You got it? Irrefutably, right? Yeah, you can make a comment. Don't worry about it. You see what happened? Yep, Zion is the hill in Jerusalem, Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. Did you catch it? Eve becomes a picture of Israel, the woman. Is that clear? Because now we're going to explain who the stars were. So again, according to Genesis 37, 9 to 11, the 12 stars, are they angels or human beings? The 12 sons of Israel make up the nation. In Revelation 12, 1, when she was crowned with 12 stars, is that referring to spirit creatures or human beings, specifically the 12 human sons of Jacob who make up the nation of Israel? Clear, right? Okay. Okay. So now, here's my question. In the context when it says the dragon drew a third of the stars with his tails and flung them to the earth. Let's go back to Revelation 12 and see where the woman is. Now you're going to answer for yourselves. You won't need me to explain it. You're going to see that it's not referring to fallen angels that rebelled with Satan when he initially rebelled. Guys, focus. Okay, Revelation 12.1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman. So she's in heaven, guys. She's in heaven. Clothed with the sun and the moon, under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So she's in heaven. And the crown of 12 stars is on her head. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. Now let's read Revelation 12, 4. Let's see if you catch it. Revelation 12, 4. Let's see if you catch it. And then I'm going to explain whether this is Mary in its initial context. In its historical context. Context, is it Mary, the blessed mother of our Lord? And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. So notice the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. In the context, the third stars of heaven. Has John already identified who or what these stars are in that chapter? Has he already told us who or what the stars are in the chapter? You got it, Mickey. Bam, Mickey got it. What John is telling you is that Satan is going to destroy a third of the nation of Israel. Bam! Mickey Ephrata got it. Yes, Sam Price. Sam Price got it. You guys are getting it. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Because if you're getting it, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glorify him and praise him. Thank you, Mickey. You're blessed with the Holy Spirit too because you're understanding. Did you get it? This is not talking about Satan's initial rebellion 
and the angels that rebelled with him. The entire chapter is talking about Satan, who's already evil, trying to destroy the woman, destroying a third of Israel. That's what Revelation 12 is talking about. Did you catch it? So where in the world do we get that this refers to Satan misleading a third of the angels to become demons? In fact, let me show you the contradiction with that interpretation. Look at Revelation 12, 4. One more time. Is this, uh, what's up with Roblox and these, these clowns that keep telling me I have an advertisement in Roblox? Like if I have a, what, what's up with them, man? What is this, man? You're going to get a roadblock. All right, Cheery. All right. Okay. Revelation 12, 4. Pay attention. It goes to show, okay. Okay. Revelation 12, over one more time. That's okay. He can teach what he wants. Raphael, that's you, right? Edmund Durantes, just say it's you, man. I'm not going to block you again. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Poor guy. He loves me so much he couldn't keep away. Because of that, I'm going to unblock you, Raphael. Because you love me so much you can't keep away. And for the record, I wasn't making fun of Padre Pio. I was making fun of love life because he adores Padre Pio. He swears by him. Okay, Revelation 12, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Now notice, the third stars of, of heaven were thrown to the earth, right? You with me there? It was thrown to the earth, right? So these stars are no longer in heaven, correct? They're on earth, correct? You guys got it? But hold on. Revelation 12, 7 to 9, Satan and the angels are still in heaven. They were not flung to the earth. Revelation 12, 7, read it. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. These stars he flung to the earth, so they're not in heaven. But Satan's angels are still in heaven. How can they be his angels? Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And there was war in heaven... Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and he prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Wait, wait. How could he have flung them on the earth when they're still with them in heaven making war, and it's Michael and his angels who then cast all of them to the earth? Nice. Right? Nice. See? Too many Protestant traditions, right? Mm. That's why we got to be biblicists. Yes, sir. That's what we want to be. You caught it now? So how are you going to tell me Revelation 12, 4, that's the demons whom he hurled to the earth, when Revelation 12, the same chapter says, he and his demons are still in heaven. And it's not until Michael and his angels cast them to the earth that they're debarred from heaven. You want me there? So what's the point? Zena, I don't know what to tell you. But we need to be humble. You know why, Zena? Because this revelation we have is the gift of God's grace. The Holy Spirit is pleased to give this to us, to me and you. So we need to be humble and say, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you were pleased to open my eyes to see this. Because I'm not better than that person or more worthy than that person. It's purely your grace and love for me. Right? Folks, and I'm being honest, I'm not educated. No college, no university, no seminary, and I'm definitely not better than any one of you. And you guys know, with my issues, my anger and patience, I give God a lot of reasons to reject me and condemn me, but praise his name. He doesn't treat me according to my works, but he gives me grace. Thank you. We love you. We're in love with you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Sam Price, they use Revelation 12.4 to argue that a third of the angels became demons. But as you saw, Revelation 12.4 has nothing to do with Satan and demons, right? So this is another passage that's misapplied like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. You with me there? This is another passage that's misapplied. Well, definitely choose Jesus. I'm better looking than everyone. Don't hate. That I got on you. Okay. So is it clear now? Revelation 12, 4 is not about Satan misleading a third of the angels to rebel because that third of the angels, he flungs to the earth. In other words, he's attacking the third of the angels, whereas his angels are still in heaven making war with Michael and his angels. Thank you, Belina. I love you too. Is that clear? 
Because if that's clear, I'm going to make the point. Is it about the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Okay. Is it about the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Love light. I don't know how come so many people get it wrong. Many got it right. I'm not the one to invent this. I'm not the first to see this, love light. So don't think I'm the first one. It's just you haven't been exposed to enough teachers to see. Not everyone teaches the same thing. No, Sam Price. I still. I don't think you got it. How can he be attacking a third of the good angels when I just showed you that those stars are not angels but the tribes of Israel? I don't think you're getting it. Right, brother? In the context, the 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob who are human, who make up Israel. He destroys a third of Israel. Who told you there are 13 tribes in Israel? I don't know. You're confusing me, brother. Even though you have a good name, my name, and you come with a price, you ain't cheap. No, but you're confusing me. No, it's 12... Stars, because they're 12 sons of Jacob or the 12 tribes of Israel. They're humans. Okay. Go ahead and read it again. Okay. Okay, now let me show you why it's not Mary. Can it be applied to Mary? I assume it can. But are we concerned with its contextual meaning? Do you want to know what it means in context? Or do you want to know whether you can apply it to someone else? What do you guys want to know? What it means in context? Or whether I can apply it to someone, someone else. Context, right? Well, let me show you why it's not Mary in the context. I've already given you enough proof to show it's not Mary, right? Because the sun and the moon and the 12 stars is taken from Genesis 37. And that refers to the nation of Israel, right? Correct? So I've already demonstrated in the context of the Old Testament, it's the nation of Israel. But... If we want to take this as a reference to Mary, because there are many Catholics who will use this to show that this proves that Mary was crowned queen of heaven. They will use it to show that when our Lord entered heaven and when it came time for Mary to leave this earth. Now, there's a debate among Catholics whether she died and was resurrected or she escaped death and was just taken bodily into heaven. Right. They use this passage. So you see, when she was taken to heaven, she was made queen of heaven. That's how they interpret it. Correct. Yep, they get it from here. This is the passage they quote to show that when it was time for Mary to be bodily assumed to heaven, because the Catholics believe that she was taken in her body to heaven. Some de debate whether she died and was raised in her body and made immortal like her son, or she escaped death and just entered. She was crowned the queen of heaven, and they use this passage. Thank you, Defending Christianity. Here's a Catholic who's open to what the Bible teaches and will put the Bible ahead of his tradition. Notice how honest this person is. God bless you. The Lord will bless and honor your heart. I'm a Catholic and agree 100% with you that is not about Mary, but about Israel. God bless you. That means you love the word and you'll accept the word over the tradition. God bless you. I respect that. That's what they believe, Zena. You're asking the wrong person. They believe she was taken in her body. It's called the bodily assumption. Right? See, Raphael, Edmund Durantes, a.k.a. Edmund Durantes, says it was her choice. Okay, now let me explain to you why this can't refer to Mary being crowned the queen of heaven. Are you ready? Are you ready for the proof? This cannot be referring to Mary being crowned the queen of heaven? Yep, exactly, Pathfinder. There are people blessed, born of the Spirit in the Catholic Church, and I know many of them, and I love them. So I don't want them to be offended. I'm just speaking the truth to the best of my ability. If I'm wrong, the Spirit will correct me and protect me. Right? Here's why. The woman is already the queen of heaven before she gives birth to Jesus. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 5. The woman is already in heaven, crowned queen in heaven before she gives birth to Christ. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 5. Watch here. And there appeared a great wonder... In heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now watch this. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, cast them down to the earth 
And dr the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Folks, this woman is already in heaven and then gives birth to the Messiah in heaven. And then he's caught to heaven to sit on God's throne. How can this be Mary when Mary was on earth when she gave birth to Christ? But this woman is in heaven. Mary wasn't crowned the queen of heaven until Christ was born and went to heaven and was taken to heaven. But this woman is already in heaven when she gives birth to Christ. You catch it? But then the woman comes down from heaven to the earth to be in the wilderness. Revelation 12, 6. Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. So notice, she comes down from heaven and enters the wilderness. This would be the opposite of what the Catholics trying to teach. The Catholic says, she left the earth, went to heaven to be queen, queen of heaven. But this woman is already queen in heaven, comes down to the earth, and flees to the wilderness. In other words, it's not meant to be taken literally. This is all symbolism. It's not a literal crowning of a literal woman in heaven it's all symbolism and you have to understand the point of the symbolism what the symbols mean and point to did you get it or no so how can this be referring to the coronation of mary when this passage this woman is already in heaven she's already a queen before she gives birth to the messiah and in heaven, she gives birth to the Messiah, Jesus, who then is taken to the throne in heaven. And then she comes down from heaven and flees to the wilderness on earth, which is the opposite of what happened to Mary, according to Catholic tradition. Mary's on earth, gives birth to Messiah. He goes to heaven, and then she follows him in heaven, and then she's crowned. Right? So in other words... This is not meant to be literal. It's highly symbolic. And these symbols are meant to be unpacked by the Spirit to see what these symbols are telling us. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't tell me it's Mary because that means Mary was already in heaven, crowned queen of heaven, and gave birth to Jesus in heaven, and left heaven and came down to earth. Are you going to argue for the pre-human existence of Mary? Are you going to say that Mary was a spirit creature in heaven, came down to become flesh? Is that what you want to argue? So this proves too much, right? If this is Mary, then Mary preexisted in heaven and in heaven gave birth to the Messiah, came down to the earth to become a woman, and then lived in the wilderness. No Catholic would argue on that, and they'd say, you're being silly. No, I'm not being silly. I'm showing how silly this position is because it's not meant to be a literal coronation of Mary in heaven after Jesus takes her to heaven when he gets there beforehand. It is symbolic language building on Old Testament imagery, and John, by the Spirit, is now unpacking that imagery to bring out its meaning and significance. It's about Israel and Israel's war with Satan, Satan's war with Israel, that Israel wants, Israel, Satan wants to destroy Israel, especially now that Messiah came from Israel. He's now even more angry at her, and now he's going to direct all his anger at the nation that gave birth to the Messiah and to her children, the church who believes in Jesus, the seed of Israel. That's what Revelation 12 is all about. That's it. No more, no less. That's it, folks. Everyone with me there? Put a one if you understood it. Put a two if you're not getting it. This is why I never use Revelation 12 to point to Mary being queen, crowned queen of heaven. Catholics will, and they're free to do what they want. But if you want to be honest to context, honest to scripture, that's not the meaning. Hayden, don't be mocking here. You won't last long, Hayden Walker, because you'll be walking all right. In fact, you'll be running.
right? So if, are you guys interested in being biblicist first and allowing the scripture to be understood in its context by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do you want your tradition to trump scripture, whether Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorian? All right, well, that's the biblical exegesis. There's no way around it. Okay? There's no way around it. Yeah. God's earthly throne was in Jerusalem on earth that he gave to David and his sons, Medic. God's heavenly throne is where God sits enthroned as king over all creation. But when the Davidic monarchy, when Israel was destroyed and displaced, and Israel no longer had a son of David reigning on earth, God's throne is only in heaven for now. Medic, let me explain. Up until the time the Davidic monarchy, meaning the kingdom of David, was still functioning on earth in Jerusalem, there were two thrones of God. God's earthly throne that he gave to David and his sons and God's heavenly throne. In heaven, God alone sits on that throne. On earth, he gave it to David and his sons. But when Israel was destroyed and scattered, now obviously they broke into two, two kingdoms, but you know what I mean. When the Jews were destroyed, scattered, and the Davidic monarchy was destroyed during the time of the Babylonian captivity, because when Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and took the Jews into captivity, when the Jews returned, they no longer had a monarchy. They no longer had a Davidic king ruling in Jerusalem, right? You with me there? They no longer had a Davidic king ruling in Jerusalem on earth. Yeah, exactly, 70 years. From that moment on, God no longer had a throne on earth. From that moment on, God no longer had a throne on earth. No, Raphael, I won't explain it because that's not the topic. With me there? God only has one throne in heaven. Now, here's where it gets shocking. Here, you want to you want to be shocked? You guys ready now to get mind blown? Jesus became a son of David in order to fulfill the promises given to David that David would have a human son sitting on his throne. Guess what, folks? When Jesus was in heaven before he became flesh, Jesus, as God, reigned on the throne with his, with his Father and the Holy Spirit. Please listen. When Jesus was in heaven before he became flesh and came to the earth, Jesus reigned in heaven, on heaven's throne, with the Father and the Spirit as the one God. Right? And when he was in heaven, he didn't have a body. He didn't have flesh. Correct? When he went back to heaven, things changed. He came down to the earth to become a man, went back to heaven as a man, and when he entered heaven, he now sits on the throne, not just as the son of God, but as the son of David. In other words, for the first time in the history of heaven, there is someone on the throne alongside the Father and the Spirit who's now a man, a son of David. So now a son of David is reigning with the Father on heaven's throne. For the first time in the history of heaven, that occurred when Jesus went back to heaven as a man, a son of David. So you understand the honor that Jesus bestowed on David? He became flesh from the line of David, becoming a son of David, so he could now go to heaven and sit on God's throne in heaven, not just as the son of God, but as the son of David. So for the first time in heaven's existence, for the first time in all of the creation of heaven, from the time heaven was created up until Jesus' return to heaven as a man in a physical body, up until that time, there was no human being on the throne, only God. But when Jesus went back to heaven, not just as the son of God, but as a man, a son of David, for the first time in heaven, angels now, now saw a human on the throne, a son of David, ruling them. Now let me prove to you. 
No, Jesus has the same physical body that was nailed, but now the difference is that physical body has been made indestructible, immortal. It cannot die. It cannot be killed. That's the only difference. But it's the same body. Okay. Let me now prove that to you. That Jesus is now in heaven as a son of David, reigning on heaven's throne, the first time in the existence of heaven since the time heaven was created first time and god then took a throne in heaven and appeared visibly to the angels the first time in heaven's existence a man entered there who previously was ruling on that throne as god but had left it for a season to become a man went back not just as god but as the god man and as the god man the son of god son of david he now reigns a son of David is sitting on heaven's throne. Let me prove it to you. Hayden Walker says, I'm a good speaker. All glory to the Holy Spirit. Raphael, you should know the answer to that. Because if it's the same body that was put to death, and that same body that was raised, then it shouldn't shock you that that body that was put to death would have the marks of those wounds as a sign of the price he paid and now he's destroyed death by raising that physical body immortal. But I'm not, let me prove that to you. Acts 2, 29 to 36. That Jesus reigns on heaven's throne as a son of David the first time in heaven's reality. A man on the throne with God in heaven. Thank you, Pathfinder. May it always flow with rivers of living water. Acts 2, 29 to 36. Read this. If you don't believe me, read. Peter, filled with the Spirit, says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, David, being a prophet, pay attention, David, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, meaning from his physical line, his physical lineage, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ. Christ would be from his physical line, his physical lineage, to sit on his throne, right? He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So what happened to him? This Jesus, both God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, Therefore, pay attention, being by the right hand of God exalted. So when God raised Jesus' flesh to life, Jesus returned in that flesh body to life. Where did Jesus go with that flesh? He was exalted to God's right hand. 33, read. And having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he, Jesus, hath shed forth, poured out the Holy Spirit, which ye now see and hear. Now watch, 34 to 36, guys, pay attention. Read these passages so you can learn. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. So Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father in heaven <clears throat> until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Did you catch it? According to Peter, filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit revealed to David the Messiah would be your physical descendant. The Messiah, your physical descendant, would die. The Messiah, your physical descendant, would be raised in his body of flesh. And in that body of flesh, your descendant, the Messiah, would go to heaven and sit at God's right hand as your descendant. Catch it? As your descendant. Did you catch it or no? Before I move on. Why would marks in a body be a flaw when those marks in the body, Raphael, are actually indication of his perfect infinite love and his perfect work as a savior who perfectly saved you by his death? So on the contrary, those marks are proof of his perfection because if he wasn't perfect, he couldn't redeem you. 
Do yourself a favor. Stop while you're ahead. Stop asking questions and focus. Why wouldn't I if Jesus has a physical body and he's physically seated on the throne? I know the right hand of God can be a metaphor, but in the context of Christ, it's more than a metaphor unless you don't believe that Christ is physically on a throne with the Father visibly seated next to him. Visibly. Rick, are you mocking when you say a flesh God sitting next to a spirit God? I hope you're not mocking. Adamu, that debate is with Muhammad, where I buried Adamu with Muhammad because the black stone wasn't able to save him or your prophet who got buried in hell. You with me there? I will Romans 10 in time. In time, I'll be doing short segments for the YouTube page. I will. But in the meantime, let's exercise some discipline and not be that generation where we need sound bites and fast food theology. Let's go back to the days of, of old where people would listen to two-hour sermons, three-hour sermons, and read 500-page books because they were hungry for the Word of God and they couldn't get enough of it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay, Winters King, let me repeat it again because I think the block is coming. I understand the right hand of God is a metaphor. But in the context of Christ, it goes beyond a metaphor because Jesus is physically, bodily on a throne with God the Father visibly seated next to him. If I have to prove my point, a lot of blocks are coming on. Okay. <clears throat> Just, just curious. That's why, guys, don't ask questions not directly related to the topic. These are good questions I want to answer, so I have to give you sound bites. The fact is, right hand of God, we know, is a metaphor. No, God the Father doesn't have a body, but he can assume <clears throat> visible forms in which you can see him as a body. Sam Price, let me repeat it again. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit can assume various visible forms and shapes. But God by nature doesn't have a body, meaning the Father doesn't have a body. The Holy Spirit by nature doesn't have a body. Jesus as God doesn't have a body, but he became man, and as a man, he has a physical body. You with me there? Exactly. These millennials do have the attention span of a squirrel on crack. <laughs> right? Let me repeat again. Father, Son, and Spirit, as God, God in his divine nature is bodiless, shapeless, formless, timeless. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit, being Almighty God, can assume any form and shape, can assume multiple forms at the same time, but are bound to none of them because by nature they don't have a body. They are shapeless, spaceless, timeless. Clear? Now, let me prove that to you. Luke 3, 22. DBS, I'm going to send you to the black stone because the black stone misses you and wants you to smooch it like the good pagan prophet of yours. So smooch away. Smooch, smooch. Okay. Luke 3, 22. What are you going to do, man? He keeps talking. It's nonsense. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. Wait, wait. The Holy Ghost is not a dove and doesn't have a body of a dove. But did you catch it? And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, Jesus. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. So here the Holy Spirit assumed a visible form that looked like a body of a dove. But he doesn't have a body, and he's not a dove. And John the Baptist saw that shape, and when he saw that shape, he realized that's the Holy Spirit. John 1, 32. John 1, 32. John 1, 32. I'm going to have to retitle the video because it's just about this. John 1, 32. And John bear record, record saying... 
I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. So I saw him visibly and a bone on him. So Holy Spirit can and does appear visibly. The Father can and does appear visibly. Jesus is a man and has a physical body. But even with that physical body, as God, he can assume different shapes. In other words, Jesus is in heaven in his physical glorified body, right? He's in heaven in his physical glorified body. But that same Jesus can then manifest his presence all over the world in various places with different shapes and forms. Which is why in Revelation 5, 5 to 6, John is told that Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah. But when he looks, he sees a lamb, a young lamb standing as though it had been slain. And that lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Well, wait, I thought Jesus is a man with a body. Yes. How is he manifesting as a lamb? Because as God, though he has a body by virtue of being man, as God, he can appear in million shapes at the same time. Even though his physical body is in heaven. Is that clear? Revelation 5, 5 to 6, which Protestant posted. So that answers the question. Okay. Did you get your answer why Revelation 12, number one, is not about Satan misleading angels to become demons? Right? Number two, it's not about Mary being crowned the queen of heaven. In its historical context, the woman, the dragon, are references to the nation of Israel, which Eve was a picture of, and Satan, the serpent, who makes war with Israel, who destroys a third of Israel, right? From whom that nation comes the Messiah, Jesus, and because of whom we who believe become her children spiritually. Is that clear? That was Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, Zarina. That was the prophet who saw Jehovah. Okay. Now, what I'm going to end it with is showing you where God the Father appeared. You want me to show you where God the Father was seen? We're going to end it with that because now we're talking about God appearing and manifesting. Thank the Lord. Okay, I'm going to show you where God the Father appeared. What do you mean a third? Well, that depends, Zena, on when you place the events of Revelation 12. Because it coincides with Jesus being taken to heaven. So it may be referring to Jews who were slaughtered before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ. Because, for example, okay, hold on. I froze. Let me give you an example, Zena. Let me example with you. Zena asked a good question. It depends on whether Revelation 12 is giving us a strict chronology or it's not giving us a timeline that this happened, then this happened, that happened, right? But you can make a case that this is referring to the dragon having attacked the Jews previously, even prior to the birth of the Messiah, right? Who then tried to destroy the Messiah. Because you remember Revelation 12? Let's read 4 and 5 one more time. Revelation 12, 4 to 5. Let me show you. That was the angel of God, Raul. That's not God the Father. That's the angel of God, not God the Father. And the angel of God is Jesus Christ in his preeminent existence. Let me show you what I mean, Zena. Watch here. Revelation 12, 4 to 5. Yes, Alpha, there will be an earthly monarchy of David. That's when Jesus returns to the earth. Why do you think Jesus is going to return to the earth? Partly to reign the earth as the physical son of David. Yes, there will be. That Jesus is coming to the earth to establish his messianic kingdom on the earth. Okay, now Zena, read with me. Revelation 12, 4 to 5. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and this cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now notice, Zena, it says that this dragon tried to destroy, devour, kill the Messiah. Yes, they're on. They are her crown, Sam's price. We read it. Go back and reread it. The 12 stars are on her head. 
Okay, now Zina, did you pay attention? The dragon tried to devour and destroy and kill this child who's the Messiah, Jesus, right? Just want to make sure Zina's getting it before I move on. Is she there? I guess she's not here. Okay, can you guys hear me? She asked a question, she's not responding. Now, if you read this, the impression is given is that the child is born, the dragon tried to kill him, and as a child, he was taken to heaven. Well, no, that's not the case. Because Jesus was on earth for over 30 years, and he didn't go to the heaven as a child. He went there as an adult. You see my point? So that's why Revelation 12 is condensing these events and is not giving you every nook and cranny and all the years that these events, <clears throat> all the length of years that it took these events to take place. You, you get what I'm saying? Because if you read it, the child is born, the child is a child, went to the throne. Well, no. Jesus went to heaven as an adult. So obviously he's condensing a lot of the time frame. So what this means is from the birth of Jesus until he was taken to heaven, the dragon did not stop and trying to kill him and devour him. But he failed. Even the cross, which he thought was him devouring Christ, killing Christ, causing Christ to fail in his ministry, backfired because the cross was Jesus's weapon to destroy him and crush him. Yeah, I'm a Mason, and your mother is a Rosicrucian, and your dad was a Luciferian. Can this guy get stupider? I mean, man, you you know, I used to think you're stupid, but now that you're opening your mouth, I have no doubt you are stupid. Your mother's a Rosicrucian, your father's a Luciferian, I'm a Mason. Let's send this guy in his merry way. Another son of Satan. Is that clear? Everyone got it though? Forget these demons, these sons of Satan. Right. He makes a strong case. He's one of the angels of Satan that was hurled to the earth. <laughs> All right. Everyone got the explanation, right? Okay, if you got the explanation, let's end it with the Father appearing. With the Father appearing. You want to see God the Father appearing? Okay, let's go to Mark 14, 61 to 62. Mark 14, 61 to 62. The Father appearing. God the Father appearing visibly and people seeing God the Father visibly. God the Father appearing visibly and people seeing God the Father visibly. Angels see him visibly and prophets were allowed to see him in visions. And so did John see him. That means when you go to heaven, you'll see the Father visibly, the Son in his physical body. And you're going to see all the saints as disembodied spirits and the host of angels. Anyway, Mark 14, 61 62, read with me. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now notice 62. And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man, Jesus the Son of Man, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So notice who Jesus claimed to be. Jesus says, I am that Son of Man who comes in the clouds of heaven. I am that Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven. You want me there? So God the Father is not the Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven, right? God the Father is not the Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven. Jesus is the Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Watch here. Acts 7, 55, 56. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now notice who Stephen sees. Pay attention. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open 
and the Son of Man, so I see the Son of Man visibly, standing on the right hand of God. That's Jesus, right? The Son of Man standing, right? Jesus is the Son of Man who is now standing at the right hand of God, correct? Alpha Omega, I just answered that, bro. Were you paying attention earlier? Now you're hurting me. You know, I love you, but you're hurting me. And people love me, don't hurt me back. Did I not just say, Alpha Omega, Jesus is going to come to the earth to establish David's monarchy on the earth in Jerusalem? Why are you asking me the same question I answered, brother? Okay, now, let's go to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Yep, we talked about that, that he stood up to greet him. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Almost done. We're going to end it with this. I'm going to have to do Michael tomorrow, God willing. Start my series on Michael tomorrow. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory in a kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Now let's read 13 again. Protestant post 13 again. Pay attention. You got to pay attention here. Daniel 7, 13. One more time. Pay attention. Pay attention here. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like to the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven. According to Jesus and the New Testament, Daniel saw the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That means he saw Jesus. So that's Jesus, right? I, Daniel, saw the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus and his followers say, that's me. That's whom Daniel saw. But now pay attention. The Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man was brought before near the Ancient of Days. So that means the Ancient of Days is not the Son of Man, right? The Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. So the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man is Jesus. Jesus is the Son of Man, and he comes to the Ancient of Days, right? So the Ancient of Days would be the Father, right? The Ancient of Days would be the Father? The Ancient of Days would be the Father, right? So the Ancient of Days is the Father. Jesus is the Son of Man who comes to the Father, the Ancient of Days. Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days, so they're not the same. Ancient days is different from the Son of Man. Son of Man of Jesus, he approaches the Ancient of Days. Ancient days is the Father, right? Okay. Now let's go to Daniel 7, 9 to 10. Daniel 7, 9 to 10. What was that? Daniel 7, 9 to 10. I beheld to the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did seat. Pay attention. Guys, read. Ancient of Days did seat. So he sees the Ancient of Days sitting, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream, stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Let's read 9 one more time. 9 one more time. Daniel 7, 9. Daniel 7, 9. One more time. Watch here. I beheld to the thrones were cast down and the ancient days did see. So he sees him sitting. He's got a garment white as snow. So he sees his robe. It's white. And he sees the hair of his head. So he sees his head, and he, say, he sees he's got white hair. Wait. He sees the Ancient of Days as an elderly man, an old man with white hair and a white robe. But we just established the Ancient of Days is not Jesus, because in 13 and 14, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, comes to the Ancient of Days. So who did Daniel see right here in visible form on the throne? Who did Daniel see here in visible form on the throne? So that means the Father has been seen, the Holy Spirit has been seen, and Jesus, we know, has been seen. 
right? But God doesn't have a physical head and physical white hair and a physical robe by nature. He assumes that appearance so that we can behold him. And why does he assume that appearance? Because that appearance goes with his title, Ancient of Days. If you're ancient, you're quite old. And white hair signifies that you're an older person, right? And why does he appear as an older pe person, someone who's ancient? Because the older you are, the wiser you're supposed to be. So this depicts God as someone who's been around for a long time and has lots of wisdom because he's experienced lots of things. That's the metaphor. You get it? That's the metaphor. And G God again appears with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but we're not going to break it today, break it down today. We'll break it down tomorrow, God willing. Take time tonight to read Revelation chapters 4 and 5. There you're going to see John in the Spirit sees God the Father on the throne, visibly on the throne, manifesting what looked like a rainbow. And in his right hand, a scroll, right hand, a scroll. And then he sees the lamb standing in front of him and the lamb reaching out and taking the scroll out of the right hand of God, the father. And then he sees the Holy Spirit as seven lampstands before the throne and as seven eyes on the face of the lamb, because that also has symbolic meaning. But there he sees the Trinity in visible form. Lord willing, I'll unpack it tomorrow. All right. Because my time is up for today. Okay? So, but you read Revelation 4 and 5 tonight, prayerfully, read it carefully. And then tomorrow, I'll unpack Revelation 4 and 5 and show you that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all appeared visibly in visible shape to John with the Holy Spirit taking on two different shapes at the same time. He appears as seven lampstands before the throne and has seven eyes on the face of the Lamb which is Jesus, right? I'm going to have to retitle this, but tomorrow, God willing, Lord Jesus willing, man, we're getting there, 165. In time, we're going to have 1,000. God willing, tomorrow, I'll be on, Lord willing, around 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time, okay? Look for me and pray. Now go back and listen to this carefully, prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to the truth, show, show you if I'm mistaken, show me where I'm mistaken so we don't repeat that error. Whatever is true, pray the Holy Spirit will confirm it and seal it in our hearts to live it out for the trying God, to love Jesus more, live for him more, and die for him. Pray for me and my daughters. Pray God will save me from my trials, provide for me financially to continue to bring this for the glory of Christ. And Lord willing, sometime this week, I will start my series on refuting the Aryan lie, the lie by Joe's witnesses and cult leaders like Greg Stafford that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and pray for our brother Idiotai Apologetics. I'm at his home. If it wasn't for his grace. I wouldn't be able to do this. Go to his YouTube page, like it, and pray for him to update that Account with more videos for the glory of Christ and pray for his loved ones. I love you for the sake of the Lord. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Take care. I love you guys.